I am fired up. That was amazing. Oh my goodness. Um, we want to bring everyone down and we're going to have a quick conversation for 20 or so minutes, but um, I just wanted to say it's my honor to be here. I knew it was a good week when I bumped into Gloria Steinem in the airport yesterday when I was going to DC for the day and to be here tonight with this crew is amazing. So Tom Donahue, get on up here. Hello. So we also want to bring up Susan Line, formerly head of ABC Entertainment. Susan. Heather, Gra Heather Graham needs no introduction. And a special guest from the movie, Maria Geis, is here. Yes. Okay. So... As a woman, as a woman, as a journalist, you know, it's not like I've been uh, covering much lately. It's been a slow year and a half. <laughs> um, I wanted to start, of course, with the man up here. And I'm curious, how did, did you find this project or did this project find you? Right, so I'll be quick because we have 20 minutes. But in 2006, you have to be too quick. I was asked to, uh, to interview a woman named Marion Doherty. And I was asked if I knew who that was. And I said, no. And I realized when I dug into Marion Doherty's life how ashamed I was because, as it turned out, she was one of the top 100 pioneers in American cinema as a casting director who had discovered and basically changed the profession of casting as we know it and movies as we know it. But what I discovered in making this film Casting By was that the profession of casting was basically erased from the history of filmmaking because it was pretty much 75% female. Yeah. And in making that film, that's where I, as a male, understood the systemic roadblocks that women faced in Hollywood. Uh, so that was a big ex learning experience for me. And then one of my executive producers, Jenny Peters, approached me and uh, said, would you consider doing a documentary on the larger issues of women in Hollywood? Mm -hmm. And f my partner, who's also a male, Alana Baleda and I, uh, we take on a project, we take on projects about social justice. We don't think we're men, these are women. This is half the population that's being discriminated against. And we, as men, are the reason why they're being discriminated against. And if we can do something to help, then we will. And we looked at each other and said yes. And we spent the next three years working with another incredible producer that came on board at New Plot Films named Carrie Ann Flynn. And we raised the money, and we made it happen. Uh, a year later, I learned about, well, really, I learned about Gina Davis's work pretty much early on. But I knew that I had to pitch her and try to get her involved and to get her name on the film, to get her support, to use her data, and to potentially tell her story. And uh, I realized this film was on-screen representation was Gina Davis and what I had heard about Maria Geis, mm. who is an incredible, incredible revolutionary. Yes, amazing yes. Woman. I knew that I had to connect the dots between on-screen and off-screen in order to make the film work. So that's, that's really what happened. Well, since you brought Maria up, Maria, I mean, I, I was talking to Maria earlier and I was saying, you know, really a really brilliant girlfriend of mine, Dartmouth, USC, film school, the whole deal, wanted to be a female director. I even hate saying female, wanted to be a director, okay? And after a couple of years, bowed out because she saw what you experienced and you know, watching you talk about being a little girl and seeing swept away and saying, I wanna do this and not realizing the war you would be waging. Do you feel like you've won? Oh, <laughs> uh, not at all. And I'm, I mean, I, I feel um, that this is just the beginning. You know, the most important thing from my view is um, what I think is the heart of this film, which is Title VII, Equal Employment Opportunity Law. And until we find a way to make sure that that law is enforced in our entertainment media industry in the United States, uh, we will not have won. So uh, we have a lot of work to do, and I'm geared up to do it. Can I say that Maria's daughter, B and her son, Will, are here tonight, if they could stand Aww. up. That's, That's B at the beginning of there the movie. They are. Proud of their mom. That's awesome. Thank you. Heather. So I've interviewed a few folks as well, and some of the stories I've heard cross, you know, cross industry, but particularly yours. Uh, sitting, hearing Sharon Stone saying, do you ask Tom Hanks to sit in my lap? I mean, can you just share a 
piece of what you've experienced through your career. Tell us a story. Well, piece. Um, I came forward with a Harvey Weinstein story. I mean, um, he called me into his office. He had a bunch of scripts on his desk. He said, uh, choose one. I want to work with you. You're so funny and talented. And he goes, and then my wife and I have an arrangement, and I can um, do whatever I want when I'm in a different city. Mm. And you said... <laughs> and I was, to be honest, I, I, it was so uncomfortable. I didn't know what to say. Um, mm. And I don't know if you want the longer story, but then I was just like, we can, to be we honest, can take I was more so details. uncomfortable that I just like, oh, great, yeah, and then I just left, right? And I was like, what just happened? And I called a friend who was an actress, and I, and I just said, how do I turn this back into a work thing? And she's like, don't be alone with him. So then uh, I, he called me, and he's like, I'm in LA. And I said, well, let's get together with this other actress, and we'll go to a restaurant. And then she called me and said, you know what, I can't do it tonight. And then he called me and said, oh, she's up in my hotel room right now. Will you come up here? <gasps> so I canceled. And then he never worked with me. <laughs> really? Yeah. And was that the kind of thing as women in Hollywood doing well? Was it this unspoken, you know what? I mean, no, I mean, he couch? is an extreme example. There's other people out there that have not yeah. been called out. There's definitely a lot of other people out there, but I don't want to say that all men are like that. There's amazing people out there too. There's beautiful, wonderful, of course. amazing men. But there's definitely it does attract those kind of men that are gross as well. No, I love how Meryl, Meryl Streep said it in the end where she said yeah. this is the you know, chivalry in the 21st century, right, is, is doing the opposite of that, is being the Tom Donahue's and, and people, the men who are inviting the, the, the you know, John at FX. Um, Susan, to you, we were talking, or I mean, between ABC and Grey's and watching your whole story with Shonda and the diversity and the one night stand and everything in between. And then with guilt, and then of course with your VC um, company in which you require, from my homework that I did on you, you require the company to have one female entrepreneur. One female founder. One yes. female founder. There has to be at it's least one female founder on the team for us to give them money. But so the thing is there aren't enough of you out there and so I'm wondering what, what early on uh, was, was the seed that was planted that enabled you to, sit, you know, even though the guy hung up on you, you still did it. How were you able to pull that off? You know, I worked in magazines, then in television, um, then in consumer products, then in e-commerce, and now in venture capital. And through all of that, the one thing that I knew was that the consumer is female, right? The person you are making this for is female. We are the dominant consumer. We always have been. So it's, it's always been clear to me that if you wanted to make something that would get that woman excited, you had to have someone who understood her intuitively. And clearly Shonda did, right? Uh, and I think that's what's behind a lot of this. But what about other men at other networks, your own colleagues at your level? Could you ever have conversations with them or no? Uh, yes, I could with some of them. Yeah. Um, in fact, Lloyd Braun, who was the, the head of ABC at the time I was president of entertainment, uh, was a huge supporter of Grey's Anatomy um, and Desperate Housewives, which we did the same year. Um, but uh, there were, uh, there is, a club atmosphere in that industry, at least there was when I was there, and it sure sounds like it's still the same, where you hire your friends and you, you don't really think about it as being, we're hiring only white men, mm -hmm. but it's the guy you go drinking with at night, it's the guy you play golf with over the weekend. Um, and so it, it just perpetuates itself because if you're not on that boy list, you don't get the jobs. So it sounds like it's changing though, but when, you know, of course we all remember Thelma and Louise and it was such a like kick-ass kind of movie and hearing Gina talk about it and you would think after Thelma and Louise something would stick and it didn't for years and years and years. Has it begun to stick? Obviously things are changing for the good but how do you make sure that you know who we see on camera and also behind the scenes is reflective of the country? 
Well, it's funny. Last month, Gina sent me a link to a headline, I think, in Vanity Fair that said, crazy rich Asians, now this will change everything, with a ha <laughs> next to it. Maybe. I mean, listening to Sandra Oh saying... No. Yeah. I, uh, to, no. to add to that, uh, you know, voluntary inside Hollywood efforts um, can get us to a certain place, but they're not going to take us the distance. It's a legal action that has been proven over and over again um, uh, historically to be what will move the needle. And we really need to keep the focus on that. There's, there's a white male hegemony. When 90% of men write the stories, 40% of those men need to lose their jobs. And that is really hard to do without causing a revolution on the male side. So how do we do that? No, I think that's true, but, but I also think that, um, that a lot of this has to do with capital and making sure that more capital gets into the hands of women mm -hmm. uh, across the But who the board. makes sure of that? Uh, it's, uh, everyone's going to have to make sure of that. There is no savior out there, but I think if, uh, if everyone begins to focus on the fact that when you only have X number of studios who make the decision about who gets hired, right? Mm -hmm. What movies get made? Who gets hired? Um, you are not going to be able to break this. And y you have to get capital away from just those few institutions into the hands of other people. And uh, once there are enough movies, enough shows, uh, enough startups in my case, uh, that are really successful, that's what changes things. It's, it's always the success and the fear then that you are going to miss out sure. that changes ultimate behavior. And there is a golden age of TV right now. There's a lot of opportunity for people really? of color and for women at the level of cable TV or streaming, which where there's less money. Where there's less money, there's more opportunity. At the, at the studio level, there's still very little opportunity for women. I, I was down in New Orleans last year interviewing Ava DuVernay. This is, a, she was, uh, you know, she's Queen Sugar uh, on OWN, and she was telling one of the reason I was down there, I was featuring her from my series American Woman on CNN, because every single episode of Queen Sugar is directed by a woman, and it's such a rarity. And I remember, I'll never forget Ava saying to me, I said, well, why don't you just take all the fame to yourself? Why, why do you share the love with all these other ladies? And she said, I don't want to be the only woman at the party. And I loved that. Um, did you ever work with a female director in your career so far? Well, I actually, I, want, I optioned a book. I optioned Leanne Moriarty book. I brought it to ABC. And the president of ABC is a woman of color. And she bought it. And Great. hopefully, knock on wood, yeah. they're making it next year. But That's we're awesome. going to hire... Like, we have a total, we hired a female writer, we have a female producer, and we want to hire female directors, so knock on wood. You knock know. on wood. It's, it's amazing seeing women in power in these power positions hiring other women. Can that, you that tell the difference, difference, though? I mean, listening to even, you know, Meryl Streep talking about Kramer versus Kramer back in the day when everyone went back and wrote the scene, and obviously it was a female, you know, but the men clearly won in writing her emotions... Have you had that sort of experience, and can you truly tell the difference when a woman is writing a woman? I think we all used to have these conversations with each other before, other women, but now we're having these conversations with everyone. You know, I think that as women, we didn't feel we could come forward and say, I'm being sexually harassed, and like we need to do something about it, or these roles are not good enough, or we need to be... I think that if she can see it, she can be it. Women didn't grow up seeing women directing or writing to the level that you know we want to do it. If you think about... like. Shakespeare and Chekhov, we didn't see female stories being told from a female point of view. This is a revolutionary time. I think the idea there's a problem is hopefully going to make a big change. And it might take a while, but I do believe people are starting to feel inspired that we as women can back each other up now. I think before we were fighting for that little cookie. We just thought there's a tiny cookie and we we're all competing Half against each other. Half yeah, of the cookie. A tiny <laughs> cookie. But now I think we're like, no, we're on the same side. We have to back each other up. Yeah. Go ahead, Maria. I was just going to say that, you know, I think that the incredible work of the ACLU and the EEOC... Actually, the ACLU is here tonight. Can oh. they stand up? <laughs> ACLU. ACLU. <laughs> They're somewhere. Yeah, that, the, the, the incredible work that they did from 2013, 2014... Um, and are continuing to do now, and, and the work of the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission of the United States Department of Justice, um, has you know, moved this into the uh, public ar arena, into mainstream media, and that has emboldened uh, women to be able to speak out. And the problem has been that Title VII 
has not been enforceable in Hollywood because if you speak out against discrimination in Hollywood, you get blacklisted. Mm. So uh, that's um, been the real game changer in my view. Tom, what about men? How can you guys help? Well, I think the heads of the studios can help, and they're mostly men, and they're becoming, actually, they're going to be more men next year than there were this year, uh, is that they can commit, much like John Landgraf did, to looking at the directing roster and say, we need to have at least 30 40% women. And I would love to get to, the point, to that point with this film, mm -hmm. where we show this film to Bob Iger and to the others and say, you know, can we come up, can we commit to that next year maybe? Paramount next year on their slate has zero female directors, which really is illegal under Title VII. That's discrimination. Yeah. That is unbelievable. What surprised you most just in all these conversations? Oh, it's so hard to say. I've been doing this for three and a half years and it's, uh, I, don't, I don't know if anything surprises me anymore. But <laughs> I think the election of Donald Trump surprised me that somebody can say those horrible things and still be elected as the most powerful person in the world blew my mind that someone could vote for him when he says things like that. But what about Natalie Portman's point standing up there? I mean, I was at the Women's March covering it for CNN in Washington, D.C. I remember banging on my, my male boss's door and saying, so I'm hearing about this march, maybe a couple hundred, couple thousand. I mean, it was hard to believe at the time, but people weren't really sure who was going to show up. And, uh, and to be in the middle of it was extraordinary. And I'll never forget how I felt just as, as a woman in this country. And I'm wondering, how has this president to any of you, uh, perhaps help stoke not a moment, but a true movement in this momentum. Who wants to go there? Uh, well, I, I felt exactly the same way. I went yeah. down to, to Washington, D.C. with two of my daughters and two of my sisters, um, and it was a high point of my life. Uh, yeah. And I do really feel that that it has brought women together, not just as a we're together, but it's really mobilized a lot of the women I work with. Uh, I see it in a lot of different industries, people beginning to start to organize to do something, which is what you did. Um, and uh, that's what's going to change things, right? Yeah. We have to just stay with it. It's not, it's not a... Uh, one day thing. It's not a one month thing. It's it's got to be consistent, and um, we got to have a lot of people who are saying no. It can't work like that anymore. Yeah. In my third interview with Gina, uh, she said that in the decades of her career, she never felt that women had her back until after the Me Too and Times Up movement, where she finally felt like women had her back. It's great. And and I and I, right. I, I would just add to that that. I, for me, the most important thing that comes out of has come out of this whole, whole movement and is in this film is that this issue, gender equality and and gender equality, particularly in our entertainment media, is not a partisan issue. It's a it's an issue for all of us, and it's an issue that can only be solved by all of us, which is why I'm so grateful that this film was directed by a man. We have so many wonderful other documentaries that are being directed by uh, women right now, and having the male perspective so beautifully um, articulated and added to the, that voice added is uh, crucial to solving this problem. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I would add one more thing to that, which is that I think it is brilliant that you focused on, on girls and on the impact of all of this on, uh, on three-year-olds and four-year-olds and five-year-olds, because everyone's got a daughter. The or images in the end with Wonder, the Wonder Woman. Went um, and that, I, I think, really helps to make it a nonpartisan issue, too. Yeah, and it matters to our sons, too. <laughs> yeah. It does. It does. Final, final note from you. The, we're, we're, uh, we got a wrap. My final note we is I, party to go I to. thank our co-presenting sponsors tonight, Lyft and Nywift, and the great Simone Perro uh, for sponsoring us. Thank you, guys. And to Artemis Rising and New Plot Films. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank this you, This changes everything. Here.